You're listening to the Greek's Gridiron, live with Ethan Haristadulu. Good morning, my USFL fans and my fellow Greeks Gridiron fans. Welcome back to the Greeks Gridiron. I am Ethan Hristodoulou, and today on this June 6, 2022, we are doing our weekly power rankings for the USFL, going through all eight teams, ranking them from worst to first. There was a little bit of movement in this week's power rankings, not a whole lot, because I feel like the teams have kind of shown where they're at at this point in the season, and we kind of have a pretty firm grasp on where everyone is, but I do have a couple, I won't spoil it. We'll, we'll talk about it when it, when we get to them. But we do have some changing going on in this week's power rankings. However, there is a handful of teams that have not moved. So without further ado, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. And before you watch this video, comment down below, what is your power rankings looking like right now? Rank all eight of them from worst to first, bottom to top. Let me know how you guys are feeling about all eight of these teams and where they stand in the USFL. But we're starting with number eight, and they've been here for quite a while. They've spent the majority of the season sitting at the bottom of the cellar as well. I gave them a couple of weeks where they weren't at number eight, but they have been here for now for like the last two or three. The Pittsburgh Maulers sitting at one and seven. The struggles just do not appear to be going anywhere for this team at this point. There's really not much else for me to say. The dysfunction in the coaching staff, the just <clears throat> the, you know, the swapping around of players and, you know, I feel like it all just started with the whole pizza thing earlier in the season and from then on it has just been an absolute mess over there and I don't even really blame the players. It's I it's a combination of everything with some lack of talent but also like I I don't like what's going on over there coaching wise and we'll just leave it at that. Not a fan of Kirby Wilson and the stack uh, the staff over there. Uh, Roland Rivers got the start this week after Vadley got pulled last week. He was 18 of 38 for 218 yards. He had a touchdown and an interception. Run game was not really good. They had 3.7 yards a carry off of 21 carries altogether, 77 yards and a touchdown. And the defense, in terms of statistics, uh, they basically notched a tackle for loss, and that was about it. The defense really did not do too much. Uh, the Maulers, leaps and bounds, I think, the bottom seller team of, of the USFL. Uh, it's really unfortunate to see the way this team shook out because I was pretty excited about the Pittsburgh Maulers. I loved their logo. I loved the odd color scheme and everything they had going for them, and I was excited to see what Kirby Wilson could do with the team, but things have not really looked too good there. Uh, and they, they're sitting at the bottom, and I don't really think that's going to change for the rest of the season. Coming in at number seven, and uh, I was hoping that this week I'd be able to punch him up a spot, but uh, man, no Clayton Thorson, no Mark Thompson, and this offense was just kind of doomed from the jump. I mean, just talk about a really tough, tough week for the Gamblers. I called them as the upset favorites for this week, and they did not get the job done. They managed just three points total. Kenji Bahar was 19 of 34 for 159 yards and an interception. The run game minus Bahar's running stats there, 17 carries, 57 yards, sorely missing Mark Thompson. Uh, I will give credit to the defense, though, man. It's really unfortunate because they had a really good game, and if the offense was able to capitalize on what the defense was doing, the Gamblers had a shot. The last time they played the Bandits, they lost on a final game-ending field goal, and I really thought that the Gamblers might be able to sneak an upset win here, but when I made my pick for the Gamblers in the upset... I did not. I was not aware that Thorson was also not going to be playing. I knew there was a possibility Mark Thompson was going to be out, but I was not aware that Thorson wasn't going to be playing either. And I mean, but the defense, man, Chris Odom, three sacks, and then altogether four sacks for the entire unit, two tackles for loss, they had an interception, a fumble recovery. I mean, especially late in the game there, the Gamblers really tried to push for a potential stealing game-stealing victory. The defense was all in on slowing things down, and they... 13 points allowed. I mean, they grinded the Bandits offense to a halt, but was not enough. The offense just could not get it done, unfortunately, and they're sitting at seven. Coming in at number six, Michigan Panthers. Paxton Lynch got the start this week, so we finally got to see the start that looked pretty good the first time around when he got an opportunity a handful of weeks ago. But I will say that this Paxton Lynch game looked like a typical Paxton Lynch game. Yes, he totaled for three touchdowns, one on the ground, two through the air. Uh, but he was, you know, 27 to 40, not terrible completion percentage wise, 251 yards solid, but a couple of backbreaking interceptions for the team. Reggie Corbin going down early in the second quarter there was definitely not the best situation for the Panthers offensively losing him, I think really hurt the team. Uh, their second half, 
uh, this is the uh, this is the second half play by play. Uh, no, I'm sorry, drive like drive by drive count here. This is what we're looking at. They started off with a punt. They went down into an interception, and then they had a turnover on downs. Then they followed it up with a fumble on the next drive before finishing off the game with a touchdown in the fourth quarter, and they did not get the extra points afterwards. Um, just abysmal performance offensively in that second half there. It, it, like I said at the beginning of this video, the bottom seller teams, they just, you know, they are where they are for a reason and they have not moved because I would, in order, I really think I have the bottom three teams organized where they should be, especially like it, it just, it, the Panthers of the, the three bottom teams seem to be the most threatening. The Gamblers have a really great defense and an offense that is just a roller coaster and then the Maulers are the Maulers. And so I really feel like I have the bottom three teams figured out here, at, at least at this point in the season. Uh, but yeah, Michigan Panthers at number six. They're one and seven, officially eliminated from the playoffs after losing to the Philadelphia Stars in a, a crushing fashion. They were completely had the doors blown off of them. Um, ugly game. It is what it is. A Jeff Fisher led team that you know the defense couldn't stop a nosebleed in this game, and it is what it is. Coming in at number five, we're looking at the Tampa Bay Bandits. They're sitting at four and four, and I'll say this. Congrats to them. They kept their playoff hopes alive in best case scenario for them. The Breakers were not able to beat the Stallions. So with that, their playoff hopes remain and an opportunity to tie things up with the Breakers and potentially even steal the playoff spot that the Breakers are trying to, you know, cling on to right now at this point in the season. But I, I will say this, the Gamblers defense, their pass protection was having fits with it all game long. The they had no answers for Odom and just the pass rush altogether. They were getting completely mauled left and right the defense though did look pretty good I will say that they were com they completely dismantled Kenji Bahar and company four sacks six tackles for loss eight interceptions four pass breakups as well a really good a really good day by the t in the entire defensive unit I'll say that the the bandits defense has had a really up and down season and I feel like there's been more downs than ups and this was a really good game and I, and I would say like a good confidence boost going into a matchup that is going to be monumental in determining whether they're able to make the playoffs or not because it, next week is must win if they want to be, make get into the playoffs here they have to win this game against the breakers next week two offensive turnovers in the fourth quarter nearly cost them this game and uh you know it, they just got to protect the ball Tayamu did not look great 12 of 21 he's coming off his worst game last week and he didn't really follow it up with too much 12 of 21 98 yards a touchdown and an interception uh, but like I said, it was an ugly game all around for the Bandits. They did get the job done, though. Luckily, the, the Gamblers were able to have an even uglier game. Their offensive woes of not being able to score in the second half bled into the first half for the Gamblers. So they were able to take advantage. They got the win, and it sets them up for a essentially a playoff game next week because if you lose next week, there's no shot. That's it. Breakers take the playoff spot. So uh, at this point win and you can hopefully get yourself in if you're able to follow it up with a game against the stallions the following week after that and good luck for the bandits on that one uh but bandits sitting at number five and that is the bottom four teams of the usfl now as we move into the top four coming in at number four still the new orleans breakers they're sitting at five and three now uh, I, you know, I voiced my concerns about the team last week and they, it honestly got compounded this week with the way things looked. Kyle Sloter, 23 of 40, near 50%, a little bit over, uh, completion wise, 250 yards and then three interceptions. And, you know, whether it was because he was getting hit or he was just making bad throws, this is the, this is like, this is Kyle Sloter in a nutshell. He has played excellent all year long for the most part, but he has had a few games where I'm just like, I walk away from the game and I'm like, wow, I, I don't know if he's actually, I don't think he's the best quarterback in the league. Like he has some really, like when his bad games happen, they are really bad. I mean, that he can't be doing that next week or if they make it in the playoffs, there's no shot because you look at some of these playoff teams, the Breakers, they're going to end up playing, uh, who is it? This, they're going to end up having to play the Stallions in the playoffs if should they make it. You're not beating the Stallions on a game like that. You already haven't beaten the Stallions as it is. I mean, you need to, they got to get, they got to get it together. You're not going to beat the Stallions come playoff time. If you're throwing three interceptions against them, just, it's just not, it's, it's, that's not it. That's not it. They got to figure something out here. A run game, three yards a carry, 23 carries for 69 yards altogether and a touchdown. I mean, there's just a lot to be desired from this offense right now. I'm really concerned about them altogether. I like them at number four right now, but you know, 
if this, uh, the teams below them weren't so bad, like I wish I could put drop them another spot, but I like them at number four for right now. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm worried. The defense had a really good game. I'll give them credit. They were able to slow things down. Four sacks, three tackles for loss. They had an interception, two fumbles, five pass breakups. If the offense could just, you know, muster something and get it together, they had a shot. But, the sta- you know, you're not going to beat the Stallions with three interceptions, plain and simple. Then coming in at number three, <clears throat> excuse me, Philadelphia Stars sitting at five and three, locking up a playoff spot. I moved them into number three last week, and I'm very comfortable having them at number three now. They have scored the most points of any team in a single game this season with the 46 they dropped on the Panthers this week. Case Cookus played out of his mind. 20 of 26, 247 yards, four passing touchdowns. He also had four carries for 118 yards and a touchdown as well. He accounted for five total touchdowns. I keep saying this week after week. I cannot believe how the Stars lucked out going from Brian Scott, who is playing so well, to Case Cookus, who is playing just as good and if not better at this point in the season. I mean, four different wide receivers caught a touchdown pass. He was wheeling and dealing all game long. The ground game was relatively absent. They had a solid outing, but I mean, they did not really need to. They did not really need to show up this week because it was the Case Cookish show from start to finish, all four quarters. But I mean, excellent game. Defense did a good job keeping the Panthers in check, minus the 18 points that they allowed in the second quarter. I mean, they pretty much shut the Panthers down the rest of the way. You know, whether it was just stops and or turnovers, whatever it may be, excellent showing. The Philadelphia Stars, like I said last week, dark horse team, they're in the playoffs now. This is a team, they're getting hot at the right time. Their passing game has been really good all year long, whether it's been Cookus or Brian Scott in QB1. And with the way the running game has emerged, at least the following two weeks, granted they didn't really have to do too much this week, and the Panthers are a little bit of a better run defense anyways, things are looking really good for the stars right now. And I mean, they've taken it to some of the better teams too. It's not like that they've been, they've getting like, they're getting blown out in their losses. Like they've lost some heartbreakers. So this is a team that I think the way they're playing football right now, you do not want to be going up against. And I would be worried whether you're, you know, the stallions, the Je- if you're playing, you know, if you're playing them in the, in the, in the championship game, or if you're the generals, cause that's who they're going to play uh, against in the semifinals. Like stars are playing some really good football, Beware of the team coming out of Philly right now, and I'm not talking to Maulers. <laughs> and then coming in at number two, like I said, there was a big change. If you've been following the power rankings, there has not been a change up until this point so far. And so here it is. Coming in at number two, I have the Birmingham Stallions sitting at 8-0 and in the number two spot. I do not believe in power rankings based off of standings alone. I actually look at the teams and how they're playing and what they are doing and how games are turning out and how they are winning and losing these games. And I take that into account. And trust me when I say that, you know, I I get it. The Stallions are 8-0. They still beat the Breakers this week. I get it. I really do. But the last couple of weeks and one, the last couple of weeks, the way the Stallions have played. And then two, the last few, uh, last handful of weeks more so for the Generals and how well they have played. The Stallions at number two just feels a little bit more right. And, you know, all season long, people have been saying, oh, well, you know, you'll be 8-0 and when you're playing a home game every single week. Well, I mean, yeah, okay, to an extent, like, fair enough. That is somewhat of an argument. But there are a lot of teams in the NFL, in other leagues that, you know, they do not win every single home game cause, just because they're at home. Like, that's not how that works. There are teams that lose at home fairly frequently, and and that's not that's to go beyond football. That's in every single sport. Uh, if we are watching the NBA Finals right now, Celtics took Game One away, and then the Warriors turn around, and then they won the second game at home. But like you know, it, it happens every single sport. You know, every single week, home teams are constantly losing. The Stallions have been one of the best teams in this league, and they were the best for a long time. But the last couple of weeks have shaken me a little bit. Just games have been a little bit ugly. Turnovers. Jamar Smith has been a little bit ugh when it comes to, like, completion percentage and things like that. He did have a touchdown, 183 yards, but he was near 50% completion. I will say, you know, he had the 45 rushing yards as well, but he had a fumble on top of it. Run game. 5.2 5.2 yards a carry off 27 carries, 141 yards, but you could knock 45 yards off of that if you wanted to eliminate Jamar Smith's co- contributions to that. The run game, not really too, too impressive, minus what Jamar Smith was doing. I will say, though, the defense continues to look like the defense. The offense is the shaky part of this team. The defense has been really good, led by Scooby Wright and company, but my confidence is a little bit shaken in the Stallions right now. And then, obviously, coming in at number one, the Generals, 
I've got to say, with them at number one, they feel like the most complete team. When they played the Stallions week one, they took it to the absolute limit, and that was one hell of a game. They lost at the end by a, you know an awesome comeback drive by the Stallions, and they notched the vi- first victory of the season. But at 7-1, and one, the Generals took that loss, and they never really looked back. And I mean, whether it's been DeAndre Johnson or Luis Perez, whoever's in at QB1, whether they're flip-flopping or someone's getting a sole start, Luis Perez has looked really good. He had 220 yards and a touchdown this past week, 18 of 24, like pro, pro numbers, the way he, just how clean he's playing. Then you couple that with Darius Victor, who, you know, I did my picks video on Friday and I said, you know, I thought he might have a big game. He was the leader in rushing touchdowns already. And he just notched another three this past week with 87 yards He had a 19 yard catch as well. I mean, This team is complete on offense and then on defense. They continue to suffocate teams. They're not the most flashy defense. They don't have a ton of sacks and things like that, but they play really good sound defense and they are coached so well over there with the New Jersey Generals that they are just the most complete team when I look at them based off of, you know, the roster and the way they're playing. And, you know, when you look at the the, the numbers and everything like that, and when you watch them, they pass the eye test in like every level, despite them being one of the worst sacking teams in the league, it feels like they're a team that are just constantly disrupting what's going on on the offense, regardless of whether they're getting into the backfield or not. And that's impressive. I really like what the generals are doing right now. I was really considering them as number one last week, and they finally sneak their way into that number one spot. Like I said, I don't believe in just standings based off of record alone. A lot goes into it all. You know, I weigh in <clears throat> who have they beaten, who have they've lost to, how long has it been since they made that loss and how different did they look from that? Like, you know, from those losses and whatnot. And, you know, I understand the Stallions beat the Generals, but that was eight weeks ago. And these two teams look a little bit different than they have the last handful of weeks alone, never mind since week one of the USFL. But those are my power rankings. I want to know what you guys have to think about them. I appreciate you guys for watching. As always, make sure you hit that like button, subscribe button, comment down below. I want to hear your guys' opinions as well. I love re- re- replying to you guys. It's fun talking to you all. So make sure you put your input down below so we can talk a little bit about it. But that's it for me. Thank you all, as always. I'll catch you guys next time. Have a good one.